The Bacon Shakespeare Manuscript, hitherto known as the Northumberland Manuscript, which originally contained copies of Bacon's Shakespeare plays Richard II and Richard III, Part 2. In Part 1, we examined the Bacon Shakespeare Manuscript, formerly known as the Northumberland Manuscript, which in its present condition still contains the following nine pieces, all of which we now know were written by Francis Bacon. In Part 2, we will now turn our attention to the eight pieces which were once present in the Bacon Shakespeare Manuscript. Three of them are already known to have been written by Bacon, as well as a letter written in the name of the Earl of Arundel, a play of which no copy survives, supposed to have been written by Thomas Nash, and a play or poem, Asmund and Cornelia, about which nothing is known, and Bacon's two Shakespeare plays, Richard II and Richard III. The orations at the Grey's Inn Revels are the six speeches of the six councillors to the Prince of Purple as part of the Christmas Grey's Inn Revels of 1594-5. It was at these Grey's Inn Revels that on the 28th of December 1594, Bacon's Shakespeare play The Comedy of Errors received its premiere. A few days later, on the 3rd of January, the members of Grey's Inn would put on an elaborate mask written and presented by their de facto Master of the Revels, Bacon, known as the Mask of Amity, in which the allegorical figures of Graeus and Templarius at the mystical altar of the Goddess of Amity reaffirmed bonds of mutual friendship and perpetual love. In mock atonement for the Night of Errors, contrived for the performance of the Comedy of Errors for the Grand Night at the Grey's Inn Revels, Bacon invited a number of family and friends, among them his uncle and cousin Sir William Cecil, Lord Burley and Sir Robert Cecil, the favourite Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex, Henry Risley, the Earl of Southampton, at Grey's Inn with Bacon from 1589, and to whom Bacon dedicated his Shakespeare poems, Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucretia the year before and Henry Percy, Earl of Northumberland, where at the residence of his descendant, Bacon's Bacon Shakespeare manuscript was later discovered, containing his Shakespeare plays Richard II and Richard III. In front of the distinguished guests, in echoing the comedy of errors at the end, the Prince of Purple placed around the neck of the Inner Temple's ambassador a carcanet or bejeweled collar, the golden chain of being, the symbol of the knighthood of the helmet, an order of his own institution, i.e. his Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood, and 24 of his retinue all vowed to observe and practice the constitutions and ordinances of the Honourable Order. When the King at Arms had read the articles of the Order of the Knighthood and concluded all its ceremonies, the Knights of the Order brought into the Hall a banquet for the Prince of Purple and the Lords in imitation of the feast celebrated at all such honourable institutions. Then a table was set on the stage before the Prince and six Lords of the Privy Council all delivered speeches written by Bacon. The Order of the Helmet, writes Alfred Dodd, himself a learned Freemason and voluminous author on Bacon and his Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood, gives a direct clue to Francis Bacon's secret activities. There is not the slightest doubt that this entertainment was based on an actual ceremonial, ac ceremonial akin to the rites of Freemasonry. It was intended to be simply a cover, an open recital that might constitute a record for posterity of unsuspected, unknown and secret organisations already in existence. The Rosy Cross Literary Society, the Rosicrucians and the Freemasons. The publication of the essays originally held in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript confirms nothing contained within it was written after early 1597. In the mid-1590s, some of Bacon's essays were already circulating in manuscript, and he intervened at the stationer's company to prevent an unauthorised edition. The first edition of his essays appeared in 1597, dedicated to Mr Anthony Bacon, his dear brother or, as he described him on the cover of his Bacon Shakespeare manuscript, Anthony Comfort and Consort.
On the outer cover of the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript, there is an entry for a piece addressed to Queen Elizabeth, written by Bacon, which has never been identified. There is, however, a memorandum on the Queen's safety comprising two fragments in Bacon's own hand among the papers at Lambeth Palace Library, which appear to have been part of a lost treatise on the subject that in every likelihood is the same as the address to the Queen originally present in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript. Internal evidence indicates that the two fragments concerned with the numerous Catholic conspiracies against the life of Queen Elizabeth date from between 30th of Jan January 1594 to September 1594. It was written at a time when Francis and Anthony Bacon were running the English Secret Service out of Essex House on the Strand, with the Earl of Essex acting as de facto Foreign Secretary, providing Queen Elizabeth with intelligence on matters of national security and the safety of her person. As indicated by its outer cover, the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript originally held a copy of what is described as the Earl of Arundel's letter to the Queen. As we have already seen the other two letters, the one addressed to a French minister in the name of Sir Francis Walsingham and the other addressed to Queen Elizabeth in the name of Sir Philip Sidney, were both written by Bacon. Philip Howard, 13th Earl of Arundel, was son and heir of Thomas Howard, 4th Duke of Norfolk, a second cousin of Queen Elizabeth. As a professed law Protestant, following the accession of Queen Elizabeth, from 1562, the premier peer of the realm, Thomas Howard, 4th Duke of Norfolk, served on the Elizabethan Privy Council alongside Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon. He was the regional prince of Norfolk, and from his palace at Kenninghall, he ruled over East Anglia as a virtual monarch. It was in East Anglia that Nicholas Bacon established his first country seat at Redgrave in Suffolk, and thereafter the Howard clan and the Bacon family lived in cheek by jowl with each other through the social and political circles that dominated life in the two counties. In addition to his relationship with Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon, the Duke of Norfolk had a fierce rivalry with Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, intensified by his opposition to the latter's aspiration to publicly marry Queen Elizabeth. In the late 1560s, Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon and his brother-in-law, Principal Secretary of State Sir William Cecil, were aware of the secretly proposed marriage of Norfolk and the Catholic Mary Queen of Scots, which represented a threat of national security and the throne of Queen Elizabeth, which would also have resulted in the overthrow of Bacon and Cecil. In the first week of October 1569, Norfolk was arrested and placed in the custody of Sir Henry Neville, whose son, Sir Henry Neville, Bacon's nephew in the form of Neville, is found tw written twice on the outer cover of the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript, above the family motto, Ne Vil Vilis. Following his release in August 1570, Norfolk participated in the Rodolphi plot with King Philip II of Spain to marry and place Mary Queen of Scots on the English throne and restore Catholicism to England. He was tried and convicted of treason in January 1572 and afterwards on the 2nd of June executed at Tower Hill. His children were left in the benevolence of Sir William Cecil Lord Burley and he bequeathed a jewelled cup to Sir Nicholas Bacon. His son, Philip Howard, was born in 1557 at Arundel House on the Strand, close to York House on the Strand, the official residence of Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon, where Francis spent his early years, where presumably the two of them first came into contact with each other, marking the start of a relationship which continued through the following decades. Howard, known by the courtesy title of the Earl of Surrey, was at Cambridge at the same time as Bacon, where he proceeded MA in 1576. It was for his Aunt Jane, Lady Lumley, daughter of Henry Fitzalan, 12th Earl of Arundel, that Sir Nicholas Bacon commissioned Petruchio Ubaldini, the model for Petruchio in The Taming of the Shrew, to produce an illuminated manuscript of the classical inscriptions on the wall of the Long Gallery at Gorhambury, now held at the British Library. During the 1580s, the Countess of Arundel converted to the Catholic faith 
and Queen Elizabeth committed her for a year to the care of Sir Thomas Shirley at Whiston in Sussex. Arundel too was suspected of favouring the Catholic religion after hearing the disputations between the Jesuit Edmund Campion and a group of Protestant divines in 1581. Three years later, on the 30th of September 1584, the Jesuit William Weston formally received Arundel into the Catholic Church, hiding his conversion from his royal mistress, the Queen. Knowing his situation was precarious, he secretly planned to flee abroad, but was betrayed by one of his servants. In April 1585, Arundel boarded a ship departing from Littlehampton in Sussex, which was boarded as soon as it entered the English Channel by one Kellaway acting on behalf of the Crown. Arundel was immediately arrested and committed to the Tower of London, where he spent the next ten years. Before fleeing, Ar Arundel wrote a letter to Queen Elizabeth explaining his actions which he left with his half-sister Lady Margaret Sackville to be passed to Elizabeth after he had safely reached France. The letter depicts him as a loving servant shunned by the Queen whose dislike of the Roman Catholic religion made her suspect and mislike him. The long letter is printed in the lives of Philip Howard, Earl of Arundel, and of Anne Dacre, his wife, edited from the original manuscripts by the Duke of Norfolk. The letter, which at one time was originally part of the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript, is entered on its outer cover as Earl of Arundel's Letter to the Queen, which it is clear from the style was written by Bacon, below which is written from your service and speeches from my Lord of Essex at the tilt. The other now missing piece from the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript is Asmund and Cornelia, about which nothing is known. It is entered twice on the outer cover of the manuscript in the list of contents, and again to the left of it above the quotation from the Shakespeare poem The Rape of Lucretia. It is generally believed to be either a lost play or a poem. Recently, Cockburn, in the Bacon Shakespeare question, suggested Asmund and Cornelia was the original title for the Shakespeare poem retitled A, Loves, A Lover's Complaint, that was first published in the same volume as the 1609 edition of the Shakespeare sonnets. That the rape of Lucretia and Asmund and Cornelia were both by the same writer, Shakespeare, i.e. Bacon, is confirmed in the opening stanza of the anonymous Epicidium, a funeral song, upon the virtuous life and godly death of the right worshipful, the Lady Helen Branch, on whose title page appears the Baconian Rosicrucian AA headpiece. You that have writ of chaste Lucretia, whose death was witness of her spotless life, or penned the praise of sad Cornelia, The name Cornelia was used by Bacon in Titus Andronicus, in a deeply personal passage which alludes to his own childhood. His adoptive mother, Lady Anne Bacon, provided Francis with a rigorous teaching in classical languages and texts. He was raised on the favourite authors of Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne Bacon's, namely Seneca and Cicero, that they used to read to each other as well as Francis. In a poem written for his wife Lady Anne in a time of his great sickness, Sir Nicholas re reveals how he took great comfort in her reading to him from her Tully, Cicero and my Seneca. The choice of name was no accident. In ancient Rome, Cornelia was considered the paragon of womanly virtue, which doubles as an apt description of Lady Anne Bacon, who was celebrated as a pious and virtuous woman by all who knew her. The name Cornelia is of Latin origin, meaning horn, which phonetically suggests bacon, and if we look more carefully at the first letters of the first two words and the first syllable of the third in Our Boy Cornelia, it provides us with an anagram A B corn, from which we are able to readily derive bacon or bacon. The 154 Shakespeare sonnets were first collected together and published in a quarto edition in 1609 with the poem A Lover's Complaint. 
The first page of the 1609 edition of the Shakespeare Sonnets is headed by the Baconian Rosicrucian AA headpiece. In the edition, the first sonnet commences with a large capital F and capital R, and following the indentation, a capital B, which provides us with the monogram FRB, or the initials for FR, Francis, B for Bacon. In like manner, the first verse of A Lover's Complaint again commences with a large capital F and enclosed within it are two other capital letters R and A. And down below the letters that make up my name and from the B in the third line reading up A and Con for Bacon. Thus it reads, my name is Fra Francis Bacon. Underneath the entry for Asmund and Cornelia on the outer cover of the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript appears the entry Isle of Dogs by Thomas Nash. The play was performed in 1597 and suppressed. It was never printed and is now lost. It has long been known to some Baconian scholars that Thomas Nash was one of Bacon's literary masks. The Isle of Dogs is referred to by Nash in the pamphlet Lenten Stuff, wherein on the inside page appears the enigmatic Baconian Rosicrucian AA headpiece. The strange turning of the Isle of Dogs from a comedy to a tragedy two summers past, with the troublesome stir which happened about it, is a general rumour that hath filled all England and such a heavy cross laid upon me. An imperfect embryo I may well call it, for I having begun but the induction and first act of it, the other four acts without my consent or the least guess of my drift or scope by the players were supplied, which bred both their trouble and mine too. The seditious play was performed some time before the 28th of July 1597, when the theatres were closed after the Privy Council had received information that a lewd play containing seditious and slanderous matter was being performed on the bank side. From the little we know of the play, it apparently criticised government policy and abuses of state. The following investigation by the governing officials resulted in several players and one of the apparent makers of the play being thrown into prison. Nash at some point fled to Yarmouth, but not without leaving incriminating papers at his lodgings. On the 15th of August, Topcliffe and others were instructed to investigate the matter further and discover what had become of the rest of the players, what copies of the play had been distributed and to whom. Whether at some point Nash himself was arrested is not altogether clear. More certain is um, among those players or actors arrested was one Ben Johnson, along with Gabriel Spencer and Robert Shea. On the 8th of October, a warrant was delivered to the keeper of Marshalsea Prison, ordering him to release Gabriel Spencer and Robert Shea, stage players, out of prison who were of late committed to his custody the like warrant for the releasing of Benjamin Johnson. The more important question of authorship has never been satisfactorily settled. By his own account, Nash insists he only penned the first act. At the same time, he seems to very carefully and deliberately say a further four acts were without his consent supplied by the players, rather than perhaps saying they were written by them. But at this distance, we cannot even be sure whether Nash possessed any knowledge of who actually did supply or pen the other four acts. The second hand, writes Chambers, has recently been found to be Ben Johnson, said without referring to or presenting any evidence to substantiate the assertion beyond the fact that Johnson had been arrested in connection with the play. This view received endorsement from his two authorities, Herford and Simpson, who initially remarked that Ben Johnson appears to have been employed to finish the fragment of a satiric comedy, The Isle of Dogs, left imperfect by Thomas Nash. But in the same paragraph, the assertion quickly hardens into certainty. The principal, if not the only hand employed, was unquestionably Johnson's. Yet, as his authorities point out in the pages directly preceding these comments, Johnson at this time was not known as a playwright, but as a journeyman player. 
we find him in 1597 playing in a strolling company of actors. And up to this time, he had not published his first dramatic work. As a consequence of the information reaching the authorities of a performance of the Isle of Dogs on the bank side, the theatres were suppressed on the 28th of July, the very day of the first entry in Henslow's diary recording a personal loan to Johnson, which all taken together indicates that his arrest in connection with the Isle of Dogs was due to him having taken part in the play. Several scholars have extensively shown that Nash was a literary mass for Bacon, in particular Edward George Harmon and W.S. Melson, and the suppressed play Isle of Dogs, for which there is an entry on the outer cover of the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript, originated from the pen of Bacon. The greatest interest in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript is that it originally held priceless and unique manuscript copies of the two Shakespeare plays, Richard II and Richard III. The Shakespeare play Richard III was entered on the Stationers' Register on the 20th of October 1597. All editions of the Shakespeare plays issued before 1598 were published anonymously, as was the first quarter edition of Richard III in 1597 which was most probably based upon the manuscript copy held in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript. Adorning the top of the inside page of, the, of this 1597 edition of Richard III is a Baconian Rosicrucian AA headpiece. A second quarto edition of Richard III was issued in 1598, but this time with the hyphenated by William Shakespeare on the title page. As with the 1597 quarto edition, a Baconian Rosicrucian AA headpiece appears at the head of the first page of the text. The other Shakespeare play, Richard II, originally contained in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript, was entered on the Stationers' Register on the 29th of August 1597 and published anonymously later the same year. Above the first page of text appears the Bacon Rosicrucian headpiece. A second quarter edition of Richard II was published the following year with the hyphenated nom de plume by William Shakespeare on its title page, again with the Baconian Rosicrucian AA headpiece, different design, at the head of the first page. In the 1597 and 1598 quarto editions, the scene relating to the deposition of Richard is omitted. The deposition scene omitted in both the 1597 and 1598 editions of Richard II is probably the most politically explosive scene in all Elizabethan drama. In Elizabethan England, the mere mention of the overthrowing of a ruling monarch amounted to treason. The author of a play depicting such a scene ran the risk of imprisonment, torture and possible execution. The play itself likened Queen Elizabeth's rule to that of Richard II's, drawing a particular parallel between his and her own tendency to be inordinately influenced by their favourites. For several years it was frequently played in London streets and houses reputedly on more than 40 occasions, presumably including the deposition scene. When report of the play reached the ears of Elizabeth, it considerably incurred her wrath, nor was the parallel between her and Richard lost on her. Years later, she is reported to have exclaimed to William Lambard, Keeper of the Records, I am Richard II, know ye not that? For this reason, and more besides, the scene was never printed in her lifetime. It was only after Elizabeth had been dead for five years that a printed version appeared inclusive of the deposition scene with the following instructive title page. The tragedy of King Richard II with new editions of the Parliament scene and the deposing of King Richard.
Beyond its first publication in 1597, the play was to form part of a series of events which would finally culminate in revolt and rebellion, precisely what its author had tried to repeatedly advise and warn his sovereign and royal mother, Queen Elizabeth, and his secret royal brother, Robert Tudor Devereux, against. A book directly linked to these unfolding events appeared early in 1599 entitled The First Part of the Life and Reign of King Henry IV, extending to the end of the first year of his reign, in effect an account of the deposing of King Richard II. The title page states it was written by J.H. with a flattering Latin dedication addressed to the Earl of Essex, signed J. Haywood. On publication, it imme immediately caused a stir. It seems the popular favourite was the talk of all London, but while ever popular with the people, Essex continued to have a tempestuous relationship with the Queen. At times, Elizabeth indulged his every whim, and at other times, Essex alienated her with his ambitious and headstrong disposition a dangerous course that his secret royal brother, Bacon, repeatedly advised him against pursuing. Prophetically, Bacon foresaw great ruin for Essex if he was not to mend his ways. On the 11th of July, 1600, almost a full 18 months after the publication of The Life and Reign of King Henry IV, Haywood was summoned to appear before the Lord Keeper, the Lord Admiral, the Secretary and the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Two days later, he was imprisoned in the Tower. In the September, Essex petitioned for a renewal of the patent of sweet wines due to expire the following month. The Queen's subsequent, subsequent refusal meant certain financial ruin. Increasingly desperate, he threw open the doors of Essex House, thereby attracting a crowd of malcontents, many of whom had previously attached themselves to him in Ireland, to discuss his position. His actions made it seem like he was holding a rival court, and the parallels between Bolingbroke and Richard II and Essex and Elizabeth alluded to in both the play Richard II and the first part of the life and reign of Henry IV were looking ever more ominous. The looming crisis just over the horizon was about to reach the point of no return. Matters finally came to a head two weeks later, when on the 6th of February, Sir Charles Percy and Sir Gilly Merrick, with others, approached the Chamberlain's, Chamberlain's men, requesting they perform the play Richard II. The request was not intended for a private gathering, rather it was to be played at the very public globe the next day. It was explicitly requested the play should include the deposition scene in an attempt to rouse the multitude in whipping up support for Essex. The circumstances leading up to the procuring of the play were afterwards described by Bacon in a declaration of the practices and treasons attempted and committed by Robert, late Earl of Essex. That the afternoon before the rebellion, Merrick, with a great company of others, that afterwards were all in the action, had procured to be played before them the play of deposing King Richard II. Neither was it casual, but a play bespoken by Merrick, and not so only, but when it was told him by one of the players that the play was old, and that they should have loss in playing it, because, because few would come to it, there were forty shillings extraordinary given to play it and so thereupon played it was. So earnest he was to satisfy his eyes with the sight of that tragedy, which he thought soon after his lord should bring from the stage to the state, but that God turned it upon their own heads. Word quickly reached Elizabeth of what was taking place. In sensing the magnitude of the threat posed by Essex and his faction, she acted swiftly. On the same day the play was acted, inclusive of the deposition scene, Essex was formally summoned to appear before the Privy Council. He pleaded he was too ill to attend, and subsequently issued orders to his supporters the insurrection was to take place the next morning. Early the next day he assembled his supporters in the courtyard of Essex House. 
that same morning several members of the Privy Council arrived at Essex House, including the Lord Chief Justice, demanding to see Essex, but an interview was denied them and they were placed under arrest. Essex proceeded to advance with his supporters down the Strand, but the expected support of the apprentices did not materialise and troops Lord to the Queen managed to block the entrance to the city. Worse was to follow. On his arrival to the city, Essex failed to secure arms badly needed from the sheriff. The guard to King of Arms, accompanied by loyal troops, addressed the would-be rebels and read out to them a royal proclamation, declaring Essex a traitor, and promised those who abandoned his cause a royal pardon. Achieving its desired effect, many of his supporters started to fall away. Those loyal to him fought their way back to Essex House, but by now it was all as good as over. The Queen's soldiers arrived soon after and with them several privy councillors who called upon Essex to surrender. After some brief defiance, he finally laid down his arms. The revolt had been quashed in less than 24 hours, with Essex arrested and imprisoned in the Tower. Prior to the trial, Bacon wrote to the Queen pleading to be excused from the proceedings on the grounds of his close relationship with Essex, but in no mood to listen, she insisted Bacon perform his duty as an officer of the law. It is remarkable that throughout the trial, even though there were numerous mentions of the first part of the life and reign of King Henry IV and the play Richard II, of which a quarto edition had long since been printed with William Shakespeare appearing on the title page, and even though Haywood had been imprisoned in the Tower for the authoring of the first part, in all the documents relating to these proceedings, no mention whatsoever was made regarding the author of Richard II. No mention of the author of a play which had been party to an insurrection of which several of the leading protagonists were subsequently executed and no measures taken by the authorities to discover his whereabouts with a view to arresting and imprisoning him for the writing of a play open to the charge of treason. In normal circumstances this would be very curious, unbelievable even, but these were no ordinary circumstances. As many suspected, and several knew, the secret author of the Shakespeare play Richard II stood there among them. On the 25th of February 1601, Essex was beheaded in the Tower along with several of his supporters, including Sir Gilly Merrick, instrumental in procuring the performance of Richard II. Dr Haywood escaped a similar fate, but he was to remain in prison for a further two years until after the death of Elizabeth. Some years after the printing of the first part of The Life and Reign of King Henry IV, Bacon had occasion to refer to the work and his sovereign's reaction to it, that he later recorded in his Apology, published after the death of Elizabeth. In it, he recalled how incensed she was with the seditious pamphlet and its flattering dedication to the Earl of Essex, so much so that she demanded that he personally look into the matter. About the same time, I remember an answer of mine in a matter which had some affinity with my Lord's cause, which, though it grew from me, went after about in others' names. For Her Majesty, being mightily incensed with that book which was dedicated to my Lord of Essex, being a story of the first year of King Henry IV, and another time when the Queen would not be persuaded that it, that it was his writing whose name was to it, but that it had some more mischievous author, and said with great indignation that she would have him racked to produce his author. Later in the Apology, Bacon had occasion to return to the matter. It was allotted to me that I should set forth some undutiful carriage of my Lord in giving occasion and countenance to a seditious pamphlet, as it was termed, which was dedicated unto him, which was the book before mentioned of King Henry IV. Whereupon I replied to that allotment and said to their lordships that it was an old matter and had no manner of coherence with the rest of the charge, being matters of Ireland, and therefore that I having been wronged by Bruits before, this would expose me to them more, and it would be said I gave in evidence mine own tales.
The true authorship of the first part of the life and reign of King Henry IV was known to Bacon's private secretary and editor, Dr. Rawley. In the 22nd Apothegm, printed in the 1671 edition of Resuscitati, Bacon's private secretary, Dr. Rawley, hints at the truth, saying Dr. Haywood is supposed to have written the first part of the life and reign of King Henry IV. Dr. Rawley, who lived with Bacon for the last 10 years of his life and was a member of his Rosicrucian Brotherhood, knew Bacon was the true author of the work presented in the name of Haywood. And there is no doubt he certainly knew Bacon was the author of the Shakespeare works. He was also likely familiar with the surviving contemporary manuscript copy of the second part of the life and reign of King Henry IV, now held at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C., itself a secret Baconian Rosicrucian Freemasonic institution. Dr. Manning describes the manuscript of the second part of the life and reign of King Henry, held at the Folger Shakespeare Library, as a scribal copy. Nevertheless, if it be a manuscript copy, the original manuscript of this work, written by Bacon, originated out of his scriptorium or literary workshop, as did the so-called Dering manuscript of Henry IV, the earliest known manuscript of a Shakespeare play corrected in Bacon's own hand, and the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript, which originally contained manuscript copies of Richard II, cognate with the first and second part of the life and reign of King Henry IV and its other Shakespeare play, Richard III. The manuscript held at the Folger Shakespeare Library of the second part of the life and reign of King Henry IV has an elegance and simplicity all of its own. It comprises, states Dr. Manning, 157 quarto-sized pages, 33 lines to each page. The number 33 comprising each and every page is simple cipher for Bacon, all written on exactly 157 quarto-sized pages, simple cipher for Fra Rosy Cross. Thus we have Bacon, brother of the Rosy Cross. On the title page of the 1597 quarto edition of Richard II, it will be observed that the word second is divided into two. This is done for the purpose of achieving the syllable con. The two lines beneath it begin with a B and A. First running up the page, we read Bacon. It will also be observed that on the title page of the 1598 quarto edition of Richard III, there is, if we read up the page, another anagram reading by Bacon. In recent times, a very substantial body of academic literature has been produced by critics and commentators surrounding the subject of Shakespeare and anagrams. In his groundbreaking work, Shakespeare's Verbal Art, its author, William Bellamy, explores the anagrammatic devices that lie beneath the surface of all Shakespearean texts, all of which are written and constructed around various concealed anagrams and other related linguistic and cryptic devices. This is a book, he writes, about Shakespeare's virtuosity in the art of anagram and how Shakespeare, the greatest poet of his age, may prove also the greatest anagrammatist. The Shakespeare poems and plays are full of Baconian secret signatures, acrostics and anagrams, and Bacon also employed these devices in Richard II and the first part of Henry IV. By one Bacon. Similarly, in Act 1, Scene 1 of 1 Henry 4, he inserts another of his secret signatures in the form of both an acrostic, F. Baco, and anagram, F. Bacon. The unique Bacon Shakespeare manuscript has for more than 150 years been presented as a collection of miscellaneous writings by different authors in attempt to distance Bacon from the authorship of the Shakespeare poems and plays. 
whereas on closer examination we have now seen that the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript represents a microcosm of the kind of examples of both anonymous and pseudonymous writings that characterised the modus operandi of his whole life. The Bacon Shakespeare manuscript originally contained 17 pieces of work, letters, religio-political tracts on national and international matters of intelligence, essays and dramatic devices and plays. On realising that all the writings in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript were conceived by Bacon, including the plays Richard II and Richard III, it provi provides further confirmation that Francis Bacon is our secret Shakespeare. <laughs>